Nor does our controversy turn mainly upon the orthodoxy of her creed. That, we admit, so far as the articles are concerned, it is upon the whole Calvinistic. We are far indeed from having so high an idea of many of the 39 articles, either on the head of accurate logical arrangement or the correct statement of theological truth. To some of them we have strong and decided objections, and to the general and unqualified approbation of them, which we often hear expressed, even by Presbyterians, we can by no means concur. As a doctrinal formulary, they are not fit to be compared with the Westminster Confession of Faith, but they are in the main evangelical, or in other words, contain the doctrines of grace, and that is vitally momentous. Nor do we deny that in every period of her history she has had ministers, sometimes more and sometimes fewer, distinguished for learning and piety. At no period, indeed, so far as we know, have these borne any proportion in point of numbers to those of a totally opposite stamp. Still, however, it is cheering to reflect that eminent servants of God, whose praise is in all the churches, have from time to time adorned her annals, and that, of late years, the number of her evangelical ministers has been decidedly on the increase. Let us not be met at the very outset, then, with the Hainacht question, do you mean to deny that there have been and still are many excellent and pious divines in the Church of England? This we by no means deny, but it is not the question at issue at all. Nor, finally, do we deny what a considerable proportion of God's people have always been found within her pale. When serious and well-founded objections are preferred against certain churches, not a few seem to think it sufficient vindication of their purity to aver that they contain, it may be, many good people. Without waiting to make a single remark upon the obvious fallacy of all such defenses, we readily admit the truth of the statement, so far as the Church of England is concerned. Notwithstanding these admissions, however, which we make cheerfully and in good faith, and others might have been specified, we have numerous and weighty objections against the prelatical establishment, objections in our view of such magnitude and importance as fully to warrant us in making it matter of special supplication at the throne of grace that this great national obstruction to the spread and triumph of the Redeemer's kingdom may be speedily removed. Number one, and first, we object to the hierarchy of the Church of England as utterly destitute the foundation of the Word of God. Upon this subject of church government, a great diversity of sentiment obtains. Some would have us to believe that there are no determinate rules in Scripture upon this point, and that it is therefore left to be settled by Christian prudence in accommodation with, uh, excuse me, in accommodation to the various circumstances in which church members may be placed. This view, however, is quite untenable. It were highly unreasonable indeed to suppose that her glorious head and lawgiver would have left her destitute of any fixed form of government for maintaining unity, order, and peace, since no society whatever can exist without law and subordination. And since we find that, in point of fact, every church is compelled to establish some form of government, such an idea appears derogatory to the wisdom and goodness of the reigning mediator. And upon appealing to the inspired record, we find that it is a mere gratuitous assumption. For the grand leading features of ecclesiastical polity are there distinctly delineated. But those who are at one upon the point that a certain form of church government is prescribed in Scripture differ widely among themselves respecting that particular form which is of exclusive divine authority. Without attempting to enumerate the various dis uh, discordant views entertained upon this subject, suffice it to remark that there are three principal and distinct forms of ecclesiastical government to which all others may be referred, namely, presbytery, episcopacy, and independency. And here a footnote. Dr. McLeod's Ecclesiastical Catechism, page 26. Now, while approximating and even coinciding in some points, these systems differ so widely in their fundamental principles that if a divine warrant can be distinctly adduced in support of one, the other two must be destitute of scriptural authority. With independence, we have at present no concern, nor is it our direct object to establish the divine right of presbytery. No. Our business is simply to show that episcopacy, or in other words, the hierarchy, church, the hierarchy excuse me, of the Church of England, has no foundation in Scripture. Quote, 
The question at issue is the equality or inequality of ministers in the Christian church, unquote. That from Boyd on Episcopacy, page 38. Quote, According to the Church of England, there is a distinction of ranks among the ministers of religion, and one of its fundamental articles is that a bishop is superior to a presbyter. In opposition to this, Presbyterians hold that the pastors of the church are of one order and of equal authority, unquote. That from Plea of Presbytery, page 138. We have adopted this statement of the ground of controversy because it is admitted on all hands to be fair and candid. We take the liberty also of subjoining the following proposition as containing a lucid and accurate statement of the Presbyterian view. Quote, the pastors of the flock, who are to give themselves to the ministry of the word and to conduct the ordinances of religion, are of one order, have no earthly superiors, and are equal in rank and power. Unquote. That from Plea of Presbytery, again, page 138. Besides pastors or teaching elders, there are also in the Presbyterian church ruling elders and deacons whose province is to attend to the wants of the poor, and hence we hold that the ordinary and permanent officers of the church are presbyters and deacons, and of the presbyters there are two distinct kinds, teaching elders or pastors and ruling elders. That from McLeod's Catechism, page 35. Episcopalians, on the other hand, maintain that there are three distinct orders of clergy placed in subordination to each other, bishops, priests, and deacons. In constructing the hierarchy, indeed, they have framed a long and cumbrous graduation of ecclesiastical ranks from, the th from these three orders, extending from the archbishop, or rather primate, down to the curate. On this head, there is a striking resemblance between the Romish and Anglican churches. Almost the only thing wanting to render the hierarchy of the latter an exact facsimile of that of the former being the cardinal and pope. It seemed good to Henry VIII to permit scarcely any change in the gorgeous framework of the Roman hierarchy, and in displacing his holiness, he took good care to have the royal supremacy, an element, if possible, still more monstrous, vested in his own person. And as things were arranged, excuse me, and as things were arranged then, they have continued to the present day. No intelligent Episcopalian, however, so far as we know, pleads an absolute just divinum for anything but the three orders, bishop, priest, and deacon. And in this there is at least discretion, for in vain would all the learning of Oxford attempt to extract from the inspired oracles even the semblance of support for the unwieldy hierarchy of the British Empire. Nor can prelatists vindicate their three orders from scripture, or show that there is any warrant at all for such a thing as superiority and inferiority among the ministers of religion. Diocese and episcopacy is, we fearlessly assert, a mere human invention. Conscious, it would seem, that it is no easy task to make out a divine warrant for the hierarchy, episcopal writers endeavor to supply what is lacking in strength and conclusiveness by the number of their arguments. Upon this topic, accordingly, we find them appealing to the different orders of the Jewish priesthood, the rulers of the synagogue, the extraordinary officers of the Christian church, the cases of Timothy and Titus, who, it is pretended, were diocesan bishops of Ephesus and Crete, the angels of the seven churches, and the primitive church and early fathers. Now, we feel truly sorry that our limits will not admit of anything like a minute ex uh, examination excuse me, of these sources of argument as we are in a condition to prove that the fabric in support of which they are reduced is utterly baseless. A brief glance is all that we can bestow upon them. Zealous Episcopalians lay much stress upon the presumed similarity of the Jewish hierarchy to that of their own church, that the services of the ancient temple were conducted by the high priest, priests, and Levites, is an obvious and acknowledged fact. But we, uttered, but we utterly deny excuse me, the prelatical inference that its threefold orders were carried out into the ministry of the Christian dispensation, and hence that the ministers of the gospel... Quote, must necessarily be in three distinct orders, unquote. That from Boyd's Sermons on the Church. This is a mere assumption, in support of which no solid argument ever had uh, has been, and we venture to predict, never will be, adduced. Where is the shadow of evidence that the three orders of the Jewish priesthood were types of the gospel ministry? Do we ever find the latter called, even by the names of these, their supposed ancient models? No, the designation priests is never employed in the inspired volume to point out Christian ministers, 
It is one of the many departures from Scripture warrant, of which we complain in the churches of Rome and England, that they call one of their orders of their ministers priests.